Well, hello there, watching the press preview, a first look then at what is on the front pages. Uh, so, time to see what's making the headlines with the broadcaster and former government minister Anna Soubry and the PR consultant Alex Dean. Welcome and lovely to see both of you. As ever, it is time for the front pages. Uh, so, let's start with The Guardian leading on multiple NHS trusts across England, declaring critical incidents as staff absences saw due to COVID. The Eye focuses on NHS leaders warning Boris Johnson over growing COVID staffing shortages. The Daily Telegraph quotes a leading vaccine expert who says we can't jab the whole planet every six months. The Daily Express leading with the Prime Minister vowing that sticking to his plan will be the way out of the pandemic, as he is quoted saying the Omicron strain is considerably milder than previous variants. That's also the lead for the times. We're on the right path, says the PM. But, says the Mail, many of us can expect a return to COVID chaos from today as more than a million people are forced to isolate. It is eating or heating as millions of families face energy bill rises this year. That's the lead story for the Metro. Financial Times reports how Apple has become the first company to hit a market capitalisation of $3 trillion. And the Daily Star says the rush to inhabit Mars has been put off after a scientist warned astronauts would turn cannibal if things went wrong. They've had a run of stories like this, haven't they? Anyway, they're having some fun as everybody heads back to work, which is kind of what Tuesday's all about. And uh, these are Tuesday's papers, are they not? Um, and the, the Daily Telegraph, uh, Alex, tackling this idea of vaccination as the route out of it and where you draw the line. So what is, um, what's this leading expert telling us? <clears throat> Telegraph has secured an interview with Sir Andrew Pollard, who is the chairman of the Joint Committee on Immunisation and Vaccination. And it is a vaccination and immunisation. And it is a fascinating uh, read on the front. <laughs> Not only does he say that we can't be jabbing everybody every six months, which isn't just a statement, it's an answer to a question that many of us will have had. Are we going to be doing this every six months? To which this leading expert's answer is no. He also goes on to say, in remarks that I think will be widely reported here and elsewhere, that when Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel spread his word, misinformation about the AstraZeneca vaccine, which of course we were widely using in the UK and was later used in continental Europe, he says that that misinformation will have led to deaths in Africa because of people being more cautious than they should have been about taking vaccines as a result of that. Indeed, he says that um, comments made in mainland Europe have real ramifications in Africa, to which one might add, I suppose they have consequences in France and Germany as well. Yeah, uh, Professor Andrew Pollard, correct me if I'm wrong, connected to the Oxford jab. So, you know, that, that's his, uh, that's the, the, the baby, as it were. Um, but, but certainly people in this country who've had a third primary jab, namely the immunocompromised, will get a fourth jab, their booster. And also uh, Israel, we know, um, only this week, uh, said that they would be fourth jabbing healthcare workers and those over 60. So the precedent is being set by the nation we kind of follow, which is, which is Israel. The, the, the problem is, yeah. Anna, I guess, is if the booster lasts at full capacity for only 10 weeks. The vulnerable older cohorts are coming to the end of their booster run um, with, with full antibody just when we get these enormous Omicron cases. So th th there's a sort of a danger there, isn't there? Look, there's a, there's a danger that if we all run away with things before we know all the facts and all the evidence, we could get things badly wrong. So we know that the history of these sorts of viruses is that they they burn themselves out because effectively they run out of hosts and they mutate. I mean, apparently Spanish flu is still around, for example, 100 years ago it first struck, but in very small numbers. And as we know that, that these sorts of um, uh, diseases, they, as we say, mutate. So, but we don't quite know. And yes, the evidence is looking good on Omicron, but you know, we know there are other consequences um, as the number of infections is rising and, and we know that the effect it's having on the NHS. So I just think that before we all rush to what would be fantastically happy conclusions that somehow it's all over, let's just be cautious. And actually, the thing that I took away from Andrew Pollard, and of course, The Telegraph has a bit of agenda here, uh, but I took away from his um, interview with them was this fact about the unvaccinated and the terrible misinformation that's being spread um, especially on uh, social media, Facebook and, and on Twitter, especially Facebook, which is just blatant lies. And we know that 
the overwhelming majority of people in hospital on the COVID wards with COVID, Omicron or Delta, are people who have not been vaccinated. And I personally think we should be taking tough measures to stop this misinformation of dangerous material on social media. It's, it's a bit tricky, isn't it, when some of that misinformation is coming from heads of government and heads of state, as he points yeah. out. But I, we should be clear. No, no, that uh, was Pollard different. Isn't saying, There's a big difference. Pollard, Pollard isn't <laughs> saying that nobody is going to be um, receiving jabs. He, go, he does go on to say that some people in the country will need to have further jabs, immunosuppressed people uh, being part of it, people who are vulnerable may need further protections. What he's talking about when saying we're not going to have to vaccinate every 16 months is whole population efforts. And that really is very good news. And the idea well, the, if the, it's the, right. the, the, the phrase, the if phrase used right. by the Prime Minister today is that it is Omicron is considerably milder, the first time he's gone so far. So the idea that it's a common cold, the problem is we now seem to be in a situation where we had 50,000 cases a day with Delta. We now have 150,000 cases a day uh, with Omicron, which is suddenly becoming normalised that that's OK, despite the fact that people are having to, to isolate. So we come on to the eye um, about staffing crises. Every industry will have a staffing crisis uh, at 150,000 plus cases a day. So, you know, at what point do we start to realise that you either treat it as a common cold or you or you don't? And, and this is the difficult phase we're in now, Anna. Yeah, but let's be careful, really careful. For some people, it definitely has been nothing more than um, just a, a heavy cold. That's not the case with everybody. And that includes people who are double vaccinated. I have people in my own family who've, who've had it and were really quite poorly, but they weren't in hospital. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about people being in hospital. But you're absolutely right. The eye is right, and other newspapers as well, is that because it is, there are so many cases now with the rules saying that you've got to isolate for at least 10 days, seven days if you have the two negative tests, that's having a huge knock-on effect, not just in the NHS, which is already under the most extraordinary stress. Um, and you know, it is really concerning what's happening in the NHS. But it also will have knock-on effects in the, in the public sector in, in in my new game, if you like, back at the criminal bar, it's going to have an effect on the criminal justice system and getting juries to sit and so on and so forth. So that this is going to be a very difficult couple of months, I reckon, especially as it's winter and we know that the NHS in particular suffers in the winter um, through the trips and slips that come because of other illnesses that people get because of the time of year. So this is a very tricky two months. We should not be under any illusions about that. So, so if it is still dangerous for many people, including the unvaccinated, which is obviously what Boris Johnson was again talking about today, and even for, you know, those of us with older parents and children at school who are very likely then to get it and you might get it and then you feel like you can't see your old relatives, this whole knock-on effect, really. Um, <clears throat> at what point do... You know, does it does it does it give, or should mitigations come in? And are the reasons they are not is because politically, Boris Johnson simply can't yes. do it. The Daily Mail: COVID chaos, fear as million isolate as we all head back to work. So, is it simply because yeah. of the politics that he can't do it, Alex? Is that why? I don't think. Well, that's a really good question, and I think we're like very likely to follow the lead um, the Americans have set and cut the isolation period to five days. And I think that if um, we well, hadn't I mean, gone to seven, To be fair, when... Boris Johnson totally ruled that out today and said that, you know, for, know. for reasons of infectivity, ruled, that it could, it it could be worse for, for stuff. We... Yeah. I, know, I think it's very likely this going, we're going to have to, uh, not least because that's part of what unions and medical practitioners are urging us uh, to do, to get people back to the front line. Now, there's quite a lot in what Anna said that I've got to agree with, actually. It's true that one of the most important things is what the hospitalisation rate is. And whilst the infection rate is a great deal higher now than it was this time last year, the hospitalisation rate isn't which implies that our vaccination uh, programme is a success. So, again, I agree with Anna, people should go out and get their jab. But then the part after that, which I think is uh, worth remembering too, is that some people will be able to work from home while self-isolating if their condition is no worse than a cold, but many, many people will not. And ultimately, if we're going to be able to restore our economy, something that matters so much, and isolations and restrictions and, heaven forbid, lockdowns are terrible for people's mental health, for the lonely, for the vulnerable, in the but, end, we're going to have to get to a point where we can live with it. And the debate is about when that point is. But there, there is a difference yes, between a this... lockdown and mitigation, isn't there? Sorry, sorry, Anna, I interrupted you. No, no, forgive me. I think, I think Alex, there's nothing wrong with agreeing, Alex. It's rather good when people of different political views come together and agree, especially on something as important as this. But I think there's something we do have to remember. 
that NHS workers are often obviously on the front line with people who have, are ill, uh, may have all sorts of vulnerabilities through their illness. And so they, we have to be absolutely certain that they are not infected when they return to work. And it, it, it may be that the, for some reason or somehow it might be different for people who aren't obviously doing those sorts of jobs. But don't let's just get into this really dangerous territory of saying, oh, well, we will just cut the rates down. And the other important thing is, you're absolutely right, Anne, that Boris Johnson suffers from two things. One, he's lost the trust of the British people. So people, when he says whatever I think he says, people go, well, actually, I'm not sure I can believe anything this man says anymore. But he's absolutely right, I think. He's more concerned about the political fallout because he's in big trouble. I don't think he's going to be prime minister this time next year. Um, but... He's in big political trouble, and so that is the thing that is guiding him, how he can win votes and keep what little confidence he still has in his own backbenchers. That counts more than actually doing the right thing by public health. Uh, and the Daily Express, uh, once again quoting, we're on the right path, the mention of, uh, of Plan B six times in a six-minute interview. Um, but Chris Hopson, uh, CEO of, of NHS Providers Today, pointing out the hospitalisation figures over the last seven days, a national increase of 75%, uh, the northeastern Yorkshire with the highest at 119%. But he did point out that the rate of growth in London cases still going up, that means, is definitely, yeah. is definitely falling. So that's what you have to ha hold on to. Uh, but it does appear that the rest of the UK outside London is about 10 days behind. So there's, there's, still, you know, there's still data to wash through the system, is there not, Alex? Yeah, I think that's right. And But you're talking about a parts of the country being 10 days behind London, not uh, 10 weeks or, or even months. And I think that's a very positive thing to point to. The point is that vaccinations work. We should have faith in what we've executed. Yes, people should get vaccinated if you haven't been jabbed. Yes, we should have a booster. But we should be looking to unlock society now. After all, in the end, the most important things are whether people have to go to hospital with this condition or whether, very sadly, they die. And it looks like, broadly speaking, this is a great deal milder, as everyone has been saying, and that it's, we have broken the link uh, between infection and hospitalisation because of our great vaccination programme. That's a really positive thing. I understand why people want to caveat all their remarks, but we should be willing in the end to say there is light at the end of the tunnel and we are going to be able to get back to normal. And just one final thought about the politics as we, as we return this week or people return to work. We're obviously already here. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's Wednesday, isn't it, Anna? Uh, it looks like a cabinet meeting in the morning. There was a very frank discussion in cabinet, we understand, before Christmas. Looks like Sadiq Javid will be speaking to the Commons uh, on Wednesday afternoon, presumably, whether people want to hear more about face masks in schools, which certainly has not made a number of Conservatives happy. If you were around that cabinet table, what would you be wanting that was different from what is being done? Well, I mean, I, I, I call me old-fashioned, but I would actually be wanting to know what the scientific advice is uh, and where, where they say we we now are uh, and whether we need to do more. I think there's a I think there's a really very strong argument that the government has not done a very good job when it comes to jabbing um, youngsters over the age of 12 uh, and that what's happening in the schools, that there were certain things that should definitely have been done. The government's been slow, whether it's been putting in ventilation, as I say, whether it's been doing a proper job on, the, on, on vaccinations. And I think that the other piece of work that really has to... And so I think I said this the last time I was on your programme, if not even earlier, is that we still haven't got into the unvaccinated in the way that we need to. And we now really need to get into that 5 million and get as many of them jabbed up. So there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And, and quick 30 seconds, same question for you, Alex, although less chance to be on the Cabinet than, than obviously, Anna. <laughs> well, so you say, let's see. Uh, I, I would say, Anna, that the uh, most significant uh, part of the politics here is what the executive decides to do uh, uh, in advice form, which isn't voted on in the House of Commons and doesn't have a, a backstop time limit on it. So we had lots of debates in the Commons before the recent relatively mild restrictions were announced, but the working from home advice is just that. It's advice from government given by government. Contrary to Anna's position, people still do listen uh, to government, hence all of us working uh, from home. Now, that's not something that anyone had a chance to vote about. And that, in the end, is a political issue. OK. The, the debate will rage, no doubt, uh, when uh, Parliament goes back this week. Thank you for the moment. Lots more still to come. Uh, we will look at The Guardian next. They write that Epstein paid Duke's accuser $500,000 to plead into that case in just a moment.
Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview uh, with me now, the broadcaster and former government minister, Anna Subri, and the PR consultant, Alex Dean. Welcome back to both of you. Um, the picture on a number of the newspapers, as you might expect, is Prince Andrew, uh, the court case being heard on Tuesday after the release of documents which showed that his accuser, Virginia Giffray, was paid $500,000, Alex. That's right. Kick off 10 o'clock um, tomorrow, uh, US time in the morning. Uh, and it looks like a sizable payment was made to uh, this accuser by Jeffrey Epstein, in which she apparently undertook not just to bring actions against him, but not to bring actions against people associated with him, which would include Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew's legal team have been briefing quite widely that they think this is going to prevent the case going ahead against Prince Andrew. That, to me, sounds uh, rather a stretch. On the other hand, as both Anna and I would probably want to stress, there are different standards that exist between criminal and civil suits. The suit that was prevailed, that prevailed against Ghislaine Maxwell was a civil suit that Prince Andrew faces criminal charges. OK, full coverage no, of that, no, obviously. No, no, the other way around. Other way around. No, sorry, it's the other way around. Other way around, what did I say? Alex. All right. No, you don't worry. You said civil for Ghislaine yeah. Maxwell. In yeah. fact, that was a criminal set of proceedings. This is a civil set of proceedings from uh, McGuffrey against uh, Prince Andrew. Yeah. Thank goodness I'm led by council. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, last minute on um, if, if Omicron will take us in crisis mode from through January and Feb, um, in, in, at the start of April, we'll, we'll start to see an energy crisis really hit, won't we, if you look at the metro? Yeah. This is going to be the big mm. difficulty for Boris Johnson is the squeeze now in the economy and some really tough times for a lot of people. And it says in the metro, eating or heating. It says in the metro that um, energy bills are going to go up by April by 46%. And then in August, another rise of 20%. And that is really going to, at, in a difficult time. Of course, taxes have gone up for a lot of working families. This is going to put the squeeze on them. And Johnson is getting a lot of grief again from his backbenchers. Extraordinary, you know, in, intervene. These are conservatives. Intervene in the market. Take 20% off fuel bills. Extraordinary political times. But a real difficulty for Johnson. I I don't think he'll be able to ride this one out. Um, uh, but it will, it will be difficult for families. Interesting. For OK. Politics. Alex, I know you'll want to come in, but it's schools back tomorrow. We need to know if they're, it's rain max or not. Uh, so for the moment, uh, Anna Subri and Alex Dean, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you at half 11 as well for more to the weather then.